we we love talking about ourselves and it's easy to get stuck in that. So hold on, let me drink a glass of water. I, I do. I love to talk about myself too. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to develop that. <laughs> I was about to jump in and tell a story about me. <laughs> Just kidding. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm your host, Ana Trujillo Limon, and this month on Framework, we're talking about serving the next generation of clients and professionals. And today I'm really excited to be joined by three of my favorite colleagues and next-gen professionals, Jabin Moore, Jalen Blackman, and Isaiah Johnson. Guys, welcome to the show and thanks for spending time with me. Thanks Thanks for having us. Yeah, so team, let's tell our listeners who you are and what you do here at Carson. And we'll start with you, Isaiah. So my name is Isaiah Johnson. I am currently in our partner development program. So it is a two year program designed for us to get a head start in the industry, have our Series 65 licenses as well as our CFP. Very cool. And Jalen? So, hey, my name's Jalen. I recently graduated from Creighton University in May 2022. Isaiah and I are in the same program and we have the same goals in mind. Awesome. Javen? Yeah, so I'm Javen Bohr. I'm a little bit different. I um, uh, I graduated from UNO um, in 2021, um, and I am now serving on the uh, Carson Private Client Team as a uh, Associate Private Client Manager. Awesome. Yeah, so Javen was actually one of the first people I met on my very first day at Carson almost three years ago in June. So that was fun. It was my very first friend at Carson. Yeah. So Javen, thanks for that warm welcome to the team. I appreciate that. Yeah, it doesn't even seem like it was that long ago. I know. It feels wow. like just yesterday. Time flies. <laughs> So we have a recent blog post that Jessica Colston, one of our coaches, wrote on serving the next gen, next gen stakeholders specifically, and you all offered such great insight. So from your perspective, how do you define a career path and growth plan, and why is that important for young professionals? And we'll start with Isaiah. I guess my view on a growth path and also a growth, I mean, career path and also a growth plan is a little bit different than a lot than most, I believe. I believe just looking at where I am now and looking at the end goal and then setting benchmarks to get there, whether it's with my direct manager or with my direct manager's boss, looking at that and also just seeing where I want to go and carving the path to get there. Another a quote I heard lately has been, you never change the end goal. You may have to change the path to get there. That's a good one. Jalen? So for me, a career path and a growth plan, they really define where you will ultimately end up in your career. So this is important because when it's properly implemented, now I know what I'm working towards. You know, you can't be wondering aimlessly in the workplace because after a while, you're going to get sick of that job. You're going to have the feelings of, oh, why, what am I doing here? I want to do something different with my life. Mm-hmm. And so that for that reason, the growth plan, the growth plan and the career path should be, I believe it should be defined. And like I like Isaiah said, to piggyback off of him, you should have an end goal in mind and you should have milestones or KPIs somewhere along the way to help you gauge how you're getting there and where you're at. That's good insight. What about you, Javen? Uh, yeah, for me, I think um, just in today's day and age, it's kind of hard to stay focused because there's so much. We're kind of like in an information overload type of era. So mm-hmm. there's so many different tracks that you could go. Um, and so for me, it's been hard to stay focused because there's just so many things that I want to do. Um, but I think having a focus uh, really helps you to streamline your plan. Um, And, you know, just approach life with a sense of direction and um, be able to actually define success, because I feel like we all have an idea of what success looks like. But, you know, uh, looking at success as the goal is kind of hard when you don't really have that defined. And so um, I think being at Carson helps me to 
better know how I want to steer my life, you know, so. Yeah, and it's funny that um, I love to hear this perspective from young professionals because I'm a, a quite a bit older than all of you. And so it's like my career started out very differently and I had a very different career trajectory in mind. So it's like, I, it's very refreshing to hear young professionals talk about a vision and how defining success. I and mean, it's like, I had a very specific vision and definition of success and I achieved that early. And then it left me feeling like, oh, well, I need to do something completely different, do something <laughs> totally different. So it's very cool to, you know, also define it, but also be flexible and kind of define what that looks like in the future. If in fact, you do reach those metrics of success. I love that. So we talked a lot about um, impact when, when you know, in Jessica's blog post and how it's really important that young professionals know that what they are doing has an impact on what the company is doing and has an impact on people. And Jabin, you specifically, you've talked a lot about having how having a sense of purpose is important for you. So let's talk about why that is and how firms can better help young professionals have that sense of purpose. So Jabin, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, I think for me, uh, just getting into the industry and actually just kind of pursuing higher education, uh, I was always kind of directed to figure out my why. And I feel like having a why helps you to, you know, better understand what your life purpose is. Um, and I think with that, you know, young professionals uh, that, you know, that I know, um, it's better to connect to something that you feel that allows you to give back. Um, a lot of people, you know, we have our own personal goals, but even within that, it's kind of uh, empty. It leaves you feeling empty if it's not attached to like how you are contributing to the betterment of society. And I think that's just kind of how our minds are wired, um, maybe because of the um, abundance of information that we have and we know that there's so many people that are struggling. Uh, for me personally, being a first generation student going into college, um, my biggest thing was like, you know, I want to set myself up right, make as, as few mistakes as possible so I'm not setting myself back further than where I already am. And then, you know, having that why was you know, makes it easier for me to know what I want to pursue uh, moving ahead. And so we always talk about like building generational wealth and things like that. Um, but I think, you know, firstly, knowing how you want to structure your life and then knowing what legacy you want to leave, that helps to kind of establish, you know, your momentum in moving forward, but also, you know, it helps you to stay grounded in that, so. Awesome, I love that. Jalen, what about you? So for me, I figure, I see that a lot of people nowadays, they don't just feel like, they don't like feeling like they're just a number, mm -hmm. just a number. So for many individuals, they want to know that they're doing meaningful work and that the work has a purpose. So there, I believe there's a couple ways companies can go about making and making their employees feel this way. For one, they could just quite simply remind them of the purpose of the work, right? They could say, hey, you're doing X so we could get Y, Z. And I think just that simple statement would uh, leave a lot of people with clarity and some satisfaction around the subject so they don't just think, why am I doing this constantly? They're not just constantly thinking, why am I doing this? Does this even need to be done? Am I needed in this? Is this important? The second thing is the encouraging piece. The companies could encourage uh, their employees and their workers when they do or they give them these tasks and let them know how great of a job they're doing and the purpose of the project. Because now I know what it's geared towards. And then on top of that, you made me feel good about doing it. So you gave me some positive reinforcement. Now I feel more comfortable doing it and I'm more willing to do it for a longer time. So with that being said, it's great to know that you can be trusted on important projects as well. So just that sense of trust, encouragement, and just being transparent with your employees. 
Yeah, and that's true. When you feel like somebody trusts you to do something and you kind of have like the the larger vision in your eyesight when you're doing your work, it, it makes it easy. It makes it easier. It makes it, you exactly. know, you kind of like, oh, yeah, I'm willing to give a little bit more. I'm willing to stay here a little bit longer, all of that great stuff. So what about you, Isaiah? You've talked about that, too. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm piggybacking off Joe, and I wholeheartedly agree with what he has to say. I mean, for me, a sense of purpose, especially now with the younger generation, it's needed. Because as a company, you have company meetings, you have company goals. But in the mix of the huge company goals, you can have a thousand employees and it's kind of hard to see how you or your team directly contributes towards that goal. So I think, again, breaking it down a little, whether it's, hey, our team, we're going to do this, we're going to do X so we can get to Y so the whole company can get to Z, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Absolutely. So the four of us are, we have a multicultural research group here at Carson Group and and speaking about why you know i love doing those meetings like getting together once a month with the four of us and kind of talking about the books we're reading and different conferences we're attending and all of that stuff is kind of one of my highlights of one of my purposes of being i guess if you will um and all of you have we've talked a lot about this in the meeting and all of you talked about this in the blog post but that we the younger generation your generation specifically values having diversity in the firms. Um, let's talk about why that's important and, and what you look for when you, you're looking at firms and evaluating whether you want to you know work there or whatnot. So let's start with Jalen on this one. All righty. So having diversity in the workplace is an important thing because we're trying to gauge the overall culture of the workplace. Mm -hmm. Culture is one of the most important things when picking a new role or a new workplace, because me personally, and from the sounds of it, a lot of other ge uh, Generation Z or newer generation people as well, if I can't vision myself getting along with the people or enjoying the people at the office, I'm probably just not going to work there. I'm going to continue my search and, you know, continue to do the uh continue to make sure that the culture is on point or i could deal with it just because if if you're you got to think about it if you're at a place for eight hours a day 40 hours a week that's that's a great chunk of your life right there mm -hmm. so you don't want to spend it with people who you don't enjoy being around or you have to diminish yourself in order to be around them as well, because then you're doing your ser yourself a disservice as well as to others because you're not being yourself. So <clears throat> even if the job has great benefits and or a high salary, at some point along the way, you're going to be looking for a foot out the door because you, you just don't enjoy working there. And at what cost? do you pay to you know exchange your well-being or happiness it's a pretty high price yep absolutely no that's absolutely true what about you isaiah i mean me personally when looking for a firm i immediately i'll go to the website and i'll see if there's any diversity within the firm mm -hmm. and if not i guess the general question my question would be why and i know in the financial services industry there's very little diversity, but also that leads to the firm owner or the executives. How do they, what is their opinion on that? And are they doing something to change it? Or am I just essentially the exception? Am I the token mm -hmm. or is this, or am I being a trailblazer and I'm, or am I leading something? Because especially in financial services, I think having no diversity also triples down to you're not reaching a certain like client database. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where a lot of firms are essentially missing a lot of, have a lot of missed opportunities. For sure. What about you, Javen? Yeah, I think um, those are really all great points. And I think it kind of comes down to like, um, you know, 
young professionals desire an organization that um, is, you know, moving towards something that is going to last and mm -hmm. um, any organization that doesn't have diversity as a priority um, is not really um, looking at the benefit of, you know, reflecting the communities that you wish to serve. And so with like the shifting of demographics and wealth um, and, you know, just knowing that there's going to be um, a difference in reality, like pretty soon, you know, there's firms that are like being proactive um, mm -hmm. with that. Um, and so if you're not, you're kind of being left behind. But I think like um, for me personally, um, I always look to an org. I kind of think long term in the organization that I want to be at because um, I'm not like the type of person that wants to jump around. And so um, I feel like for me, if it feels like somewhere that I can grow, um, you know, that has culture has a lot to do with that. Um, but also, you know, just like, you know, how I knowing that I fit, you know, I fit in and mm -hmm. that you know, I can have a sense of belonging. Like, I feel like that's kind of what we're all looking for, um, yeah. especially coming from a college campus where it's like you have your um, safe spaces mm -hmm. um, that are created to be to make you feel like you belong. Um, I think it's kind of different in the workplace, um, but those that are kind of moving towards making that a priority, I think those organizations are uh, going to last a lot longer. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think what's cool about like our research group, even though we're small for now, like we're we're talking about opening, we're, we're going to open it up to the entire Carson partner ecosystem. So I know it's hard for smaller firms to be able to offer things like research groups and, and stuff like that, which is that's why we want to open it up because our partners, if they are a smaller firm and they do have employees from underrepresented backgrounds, there is a space for them to come just like that college campus where you know, we have our safe, safe place, but it's not like our research group is not like, oh, let's get together and talk about negative things. It's like, it's like, let's build each other up and lift each other up and let's share all of these different things we're learning outside of the scope of our work. Um, you know, like I love how we talk about our books and right and all the give a little summary of the books and talk about conferences we're going to. Um, in that element of culture. So I'm going to go off script here a little bit. I know we had our questions, but um, Jabin, you brought up the like culture and things that are important in that respect. What are some of, of like really some elements of a firm's culture that are especially important to you? And we'll, we'll start with you, Jabin, since you sparked yeah. that question. <laughs> yeah, I think it goes back to the impact question mm -hmm. of like, what what is the greater good that our company serves mm -hmm. like you know we're going to be making money but you know on the other side the thing that kind of brings value to me as a stakeholder is knowing that my day-to-day -day, um tasks everything that i'm doing you know 40 to 50 hours a week spent at work like is it helping to benefit the society as a whole mm -hmm. um and are the employees aligned with that? So like, you know, we talk about like the vision and uh, the pillars and, you know, the goals that we have as an organization, but kind of like in tandem with that, like how are we um, also just like a betterment to society? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of helps foster a culture that cares and, that, you know, can better reflect, you know, how we want to live in society. So. Yeah, no, I agree with that too. And I'll add, like, I like one element of, of culture that I think is really important. Like I am what they call a geriatric millennial, which I find very offensive. <laughs> I guess you could say elder millennial or like, you know, I'm, I'm on the higher end of the millennial to older. Like a, a I know, it sounds term. like I need a walker or something. I get it. <laughs> But sometimes when I talk to my nieces and nephews who are younger Gen Z, I do feel like I might, you know, I'm a little geriatric. But um, 
the the element of like transparency and communication and keeping us informed and stuff. I really appreciate that about different cultures. And so anyways, I, I just uh, put that out there. Like I like that having a clear impact, transparent communication, all of that stuff is great. So Jalen, what about you? What, what elements of, of a firm's culture are important to you? Well, yeah, so there's that diversity piece, obviously, because that's what that's what we've been preaching. Mm-hmm. So there's that diversity piece. There's also just the general demographics of the place. Like if the average employee is like 55, I'm I'm 20, I'm 23. I'm probably not gonna work at that place. You know what I'm saying? So uh, we combine the diversity with the demographics of the the workplace and then just the experience. And I guess this also ties into diversity as well, but the different experiences and paths and walks of life, walks of life that the, uh, that's between the employees themselves, just to say like, how different are you guys? You know, are all you guys from the same place, grew up, experienced the same things, parents were the same way, you know, how how different are you guys? I guess that's a I guess that also directly ties in with diversity. But those are some of the things that I'm looking for when I'm going and I'm, you know, shadowing or whatever a mock work days. I know a lot of places do those. Whenever I'm doing things like that, I'm looking to see those type of things. Where are we inconsistent? Where are we consistent? Can this, can this, is this okay even though you don't have this? Or is this okay even though you do have this? Things like that. Very cool. What about you, Isaiah? I mean, one culture is huge. Culture is huge. Transparency, like you said earlier, Anna. I think for me, transparency is that definitely has to be number one. Mm-hmm. And also having everyone being down to earth. I guess when I like, when I remember my first day, I walked into Carson, I met Michaela and she was just down to earth herself. I met, I met Jabin prior. I met Jalen. And I mean, I'm from Detroit. Jalen's from St. Louis. Jabin's from Omaha, but we have some things in common and not that we're all African American males, but we have things in common and, we talk outside of work and different things. So I guess that's what's really important for me because I mean, I moved here from Detroit and I didn't really know anyone. I just had my coworkers. So I guess it's able to be like, how personable are my coworkers and am I able to talk up, talk to them or with them about certain things that may not pertain to work? Yeah, that's really important to you all kind of touched on that, that element of having people at work who you kind of connect with and you could talk with and kind of um and and to speak to your point Jalen about you know like the different I I come from a super small town and like everybody's the same we're very uh, it's very homogeneous population there and so what I found when I first started working as a young professional is like everybody was everybody was different from me everybody was like from a totally different place and that was one of the most exciting things as a young professional is to get to know so many people from so many different backgrounds who had such different life experiences from me. Um, And like our coaching team, you know, they talk a lot about that, like attitude of curiosity, like being curious to learn about people, asking them questions and connecting with them on a deeper level is really important. Um, And so this this brings me to my next question, which is again, off the script. Sorry, guys. Um, But what what do you feel like in the, the years that you have been working in the workforce, what has helped you kind of make those connections, whether it's an attitude of having the attitude of like curiosity or open mindedness or being adaptable? Like, What are some of the things that have helped you succeed here at Carson and in the industry? And what do you recommend and advise other young professionals, the skills to develop um, to do that? And we'll start with you, Jabin, if that's OK. Yeah, so. For me, I think it's definitely the curiosity and Mm -hmm. um, always being a learner and um, not being afraid to ask questions, not being afraid to, you know, be the dumbest person in the room. Um, Like for me, it's just like um, I um, before Carson, you know, I was pursuing 
I did entrepreneurship in college and real estate. And so, you know, in my um, uh, studies, learning just about, you know, entrepreneurship is kind of broad. A lot of times when I tell people I've majored in entrepreneurship, they're like, I didn't even know that could be a major. Um, but it kind of really talks about um, just the power of like ownership and having a stake in, you know, society in that way. Um, and I think with that, having um, just an open mind and approach to just how you're going to impact society, I think that allows you to fl flourish better um, because, you know, I think like the main, main thing that I learned in my course is it's like um, passion does a lot for, um, you know, your longevity in a profession, but it's not all there is. Like you can be very passionate about something and lose passion um, eventually, you know, with the workload. And so like, you know, attaching, you know, work ethic and um, also being able to delegate and just knowing how a business function, all of that kind of adds like the holistic view of how you're going to, um, you know, last in this hustle culture. Um, yeah. I feel like hustle culture too, like that can be a drab, like, um, because it's, it's almost like the society as a whole is kind of in this hustle mentality. So it's like, it's almost like, it kind of chose our generation like we didn't cho choose it so uh we we're all kind of forced to like have this go get it mindset but i think with that attaching it to like i'm just i just want to be curious to learn all that i can learn about whatever it may be having that focus is like really important as well so that you're not all over the place um but yeah all that to say you know i think it's important to stay curious and always be learning so for sure and i'll add to that like the the adaptability what's a, one of our core values here at carson right to be adaptable and i think i have found that that's been one of the most valuable things that i've developed in the last like maybe decade is that you know in in this time we've lived right through a pandemic i've, I've had a few different jobs i've had promotions and all these good things happening in my life but with with all of that, it's a, it's a transition. You have to be adaptable and you have to learn how to kind of navigate those different types of things. So that's, I'll add to that. Love Especially adaptability. Especially with the advancement of technology. Like yeah, for sure. Everything's changing so rapidly. Yeah. So Jalen, what about you? What are some, you know, traits that you've developed that have helped you and what do you recommend other young professionals develop? So I learned to be interested rather than interesting mm -hmm. and what that means is kind of it kind of goes back to the curiosity thing but what that means is to just place the emphasis on other people when you're trying to get to know them we we love talking about ourselves and it's easy to get stuck in that so hold on let me pass it over. I, I do. I love to talk about myself too. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to develop that. <laughs> I was about to jump in and tell a story about me. <laughs> Just kidding. So being interesting really goes a long way, not just to yourself, but to people in general, because they recognize that and they feel good that you're asking them questions and it really helps create quality connections The more questions you ask. And <clears throat> And I would tell younger people to just be open minded mm -hmm. because you never truly know what you're getting into. Like you have a good idea, but it's never going to go to a T. Like the quote says, the best laid plans go awry. Uh, nothing's mm -hmm. going to happen 100% to a T. So be open minded, ask questions, make yourself valuable, and those are a few of the things I've learned and they've helped me gain more success as I go along in my career. 
I love that. I love I love that saying. My mom used to say, um, "El hombre pone y Dios dispone." Like man plans, but God's like, "No, it's just, I have something else in mind for you." So I, I always live by that. Like, yeah, it's, it's never gonna go according to plan, and that's okay. That's where adaptability comes in. But what about you, Isaiah? Of course, ask questions. I mean, me joining Carson under the leadership of Aaron Woods team, it was great. But I had to ask questions, but also. I would say look for opportunities on where you can add value. Depending on where you are, whether it's research, me, I majored in just regular business administration. And so coming in on the advanced solutions team, I was I was pretty clueless, I'll be honest. But with me asking questions and seeing where I could add value, whether it was a research report or different things, that's how I learned a lot. And also going back to the growth plan and that that's also how my growth plan was put together was because I was constantly curious, asking Aaron Wood and her team questions about different things. And that's where the growth plan came in place was Isaiah, what do you really want to do? And then I found a mentor who I can, who has a position that I can see myself in within the next 10 years. And that's what I, that's how I've been engaging myself in my growth. No, that's great. And then and another thing I'll add to that is that element of you all kind of touched on like having a vision for yourself and what you really want to do, but also being able to tell your leaders about that. Like that's one thing that has been very helpful in my career, but like being able to articulate your vision about your career and then being also to communicate it and, and be able to have those leaders advocate for you also. That's a very valuable thing to have. And that's not just on the young professionals, right? That's on the leaders and people who are listening who are leaders of young professionals to just like be sure to ask what, what do they like, just like Isaiah just said, what do you really want to do? What's your what's your passion? What's your vision for your life? So I love all of this stuff together has been wonderful. Um, and so, you know, we've been kind of ending these uh, as we come to a close on framework um, with this notion of reframing our thinking on stuff, right? We have a new web series for women in wealth management called Reframe, where we're trying to get people to reframe their thinking on different ways we can address the underrepresentation of women. And so I've been using that on framework too. Um, and my last question is, what's one thing you wish older generations would reframe their thinking about when it comes to attracting, retaining, and working with Gen Z specifically? And we'll start with Isaiah on this one. I will say I hope that they reframe their thinking about saying like, oh, the new generation of Gen Z is lazy. Mm -hmm. I would say that it's being efficient and doing, being able to do more with less. That's, that's what I believe Gen Z has been doing a great job with regarding technology, whether it's financial planning or just the workforce in general. It's just, mm -hmm. we're not lazy. We're looking for the most efficient way to get everything done. And I'll, I think that your generation really, it's, it's like, the, I love the efficiency, but y'all are just really questioning why, like, why do we do things this way? And kind of forcing everybody in the other generations to kind of look at like, yeah, why do we do things this way? So it's like, I just love that. I wanted to add on that. Just give Gen Z's a shout out. Y'all are really helping everybody reframe their thinking on a lot of stuff. So yeah. let's go to Javen next. Yeah, I think like just having an open mind to also be curious about us, you know, mm -hmm. like we're coming into the workplace, you know, looking to learn all that we can, but also with everything, you know, changing so rapidly, also like, you know, figuring out how you can include us in what what's changing. Mm -hmm. um, I think with like um, the new AI and all that stuff that's kind of coming up. Um, I think there's like a, a resistance to change and a resistance to like try to um, figure out how you can do things a little differently. But it's like sometimes I feel more valued when um, I'm asked my opinion on things because I feel like um, you're not just going to make a decision on my behalf, but like you'll include me in the decision. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I can learn a lot better that way. Um, and I can, I think it helps with the working relationship as well, because it's kind of like, um, you know, 
pulling from each other's lived experiences. Um, I know that within, you know, going, just going to college in the time that we went to college, you know, a lot was different from, you know, a professional who's been in the industry for 30 plus years. And so I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Absolutely. And, here, you know, at Carson Coaching, our co coaches have, they recommend firm owners and advisors have advisory councils made up of their clients, so client advisory boards. Um, and so they're asking their clients, like, what do you want? Like, what do you think? What, and then kind of shaping their offering based on the feedback that comes from those advisory councils. And I, I liken what you said, Javen, to that. It's like, how do we know how to work with Gen Z and, and what they're looking for in firms unless we're, you know, having conversations like this where we're actually asking right. their input. Yeah. So that's such a valuable. I love that insight. So what about you, Jalen? So for me, it would be diversity again, mm -hmm. because I feel like a lot of firms look at this at from the wrong perspective. They're just like, oh, everybody's diverse now all the companies are doing it so we got to do it too so we look competitive uh, so we could compete with other companies but it's really should be more genuine i feel like i feel like a lot of these firms just play the numbers game with the diversity thing and they just figure oh the more minorities we pull in the more attractive we look the more women in leadership or minorities in leadership positions we have, the more attractive we look. And it's kind of degrading, honestly, mm -hmm. to the to the person. So I think uh, things should be more genuine nowadays when it comes to diversity, instead of just always looking for a way to increase your bottom line. Yeah. No, for sure. And I think, and again, I'm going to plug our, our little sanctuary resource group, even though the four of us were small but mighty. Like, it's stuff like that, that kind of, you know, as an underrepresented professional, for me, like, that gives me just just life to kind of, you know, so I appreciate, I just wanted to say thank you to the three of you for being part of that. And as we're going to open it up to partners and we're going to kind of create that space for everybody um, else who might want be interested. I, I just love that. And I appreciate all three of you for joining me today. So thank you all. Thank you. For having me. Thank you. And the rest of you, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Framework Podcast. As you're starting to map out your fall conferences, please put Excel on that list. This year is going to be really magical. We're going to be in Orlando. It's going to be amazing. So visit us at excelconference.com. That's Excel with two L's. And we hope to see you there. Thanks for tuning in.